episode 141 of The World Beyond Belief, Baltimore's Hunger Games and the UFO Connection. I am Mindy Erkin, your co-host, and with me today is your host, Paul Marco. Hi, welcome back to The World Beyond Belief. This could be a real exciting World Beyond Belief because I'm going to try to do a whole lot of stuff. I'm going to try to put things in perspective. I mean real perspective, from the micro level to the macro level. And I'm going to try to do it in our just our one little two-hour podcast. So we're going to move along pretty quickly. I want to move from, you know how the, the analogy is you can't see the forest for the trees? Well, I think that happens a lot. But I'm going to show a lot more than the, than the trees and the forest. I'm going to show the whole landscape and perhaps the whole globe in our perspective. We're going to back up and back up. We're going to go from tight in analysis to synthesis. We're going to move from the left brain look at things to the right brain look at things. From Apollo to Dionysus. And I'm going to use the Baltimore riots because they're contemporary, but I could have used many other false flags. I could have used the Texas false flag that just occurred or the Palestinian situation where they're being genocized, or the Boston bombing, or, or many of the others to show how we can see the trees, see the forest, and then back up and back up so we can see the whole situation. So, without further ado, let's start with the micro level. Now, I'm going to play a little clip from Luke Rutkowski. And if you've watched, if you've listened to this podcast very often, you know that Probably one of my most admired people is Luke Rutkowski. I've watched him go from a, from a kid with a camera and a lot of guts interviewing major people to a real mature, sophisticated journalist now. Let's look, let's listen to Luke's interview about the Baltimore riots and then we'll take an analysis from there. Here's Luke. This is Rudowski of WeAreChange.org here in Baltimore, Maryland, with what people are calling the Baltimore Uprisings. I am joined here by Timothy Poole, who's a veteran journalist. He's worked for Fusion now. He's been here on the ground with me, getting shot at by the police and also dealing with the insane situation here. Now, Baltimore and everything that has been occurring here within the last few days is extremely complicated to understand. There's so many different facets. There's so many different variables. There's so many misleading news reports and biases being just thrown at you, uh, but it's, it's very hard to get a kind of overall, kind of larger picture of what's happening here. But Tim, how do you see everything here? I think a good, a good example of what happened, first you had this report come out from the police, the credible threat report, yeah. then you have another report showing the gang members saying that's not true. You're hearing the police saying that the, the other prisoner in the van with Freddie Gray was saying that Freddie Gray was attempting to hurt himself, and now a report from this man saying that's not true. So there's just so much conflicting information. I mean, we actually spoke with a gang member who said, you know, nobody called us up and told us to go, go out and, you know, fuck shit up, using his words. and. Uh, and that this had nothing to do with the gang. So it's, it's really difficult to understand. It's because, I mean, first of all, in a breaking news situation, it's hard to know what's causing all of this and who's, t who's right and who's wrong. And the facts are all up in the air until we have an opportunity to actually sift through everything. But you, what, I, what I find interesting is many people who have different kind of approaches to reporting on this will take one side and just run with it. And when they do that, they kind of galvanize an audience who already has those preconceived notions. And you see a lot of kind of biased kind of reporting of what's on the ground here. You see a lot of people just calling these people thugs and looters. And then you see a lot of people here just highlighting the issues of how peaceful and community building. But in reality, the truth is kind of in the middle where you have both of that, where we're here reporting uh, yes, cops are also shooting at us, but there's also people here who are threatening to beat the crap out of us uh, for being white or for filming them violating the law as well. At the same time, there's also amazing people in the community here who are trying to get everyone home before the curfew, making sure no one gets arrested, doing community building, bringing uh, the community together to help each other out, to build a solid nonviolent movement. So you have those kind of you know, conflicting reports, one side just calling these guys looters, another side saying, no, these guys are actually starting a new movement, that's very important. Um, 
How do you see the conjecture of everything that's kind of developing here as we're getting all this news? It's the biggest bummer, man. Yeah. You've got pigs and you've got thugs. You've got one side saying they're all pigs, one side saying they're all thugs, and it's, it's, it's just a bummer that, you know, the first instinct everyone has is, I hate you, you know? And it, it, it's, it, it really comes down to, you know, people want to hear the things that, it's their bias. They want to hear the things that they already believe. And it's tough because, you know, I think bias isn't bad but the inability to recognize your bias is bad. So, you know, we might have a lot of experiences where we had a neg neg negative experience with writers or a negative experience with police, but we always have to stop and say, but let's take the situation for what it is, right? Even, even if you believe that one group, whatever, whichever group it is, is mostly bad, you still gotta recognize the individual situation and try and recognize the individual person. It's, it's tough, but we don't do that. Most people don't do that. So instead, it's just, you've got, you know, guys back over where, where we're standing here, uh, where we're standing, they were throwing rocks, and you've got police shooting back, and you've got police shooting at us. So it's, you know, we have this bad experience, so now we're, we're pissed, and that's going to affect how, how we see the world. It's, it's, it's a challenge, man. Yeah. How do we get to the point where we don't throw rocks and we don't shoot at each other? That's the big challenge. And how do we see the larger picture of everything and not just paint one human being as the whole crowd, not just one person throwing rocks as the whole crowd, not just one officer aiming at us as all of the police officers? Because one, one, one thing I also find is whenever you do take a very strong point on one position, on one issue, you galvanize a lot of audience to come your way. You galvanize a lot of comments. You galvanize a lot of likes. And that's what you see media organizations kind of dividing and conquering, putting up these sides to, you know, against each other. And when they do that, they get more clicks, they get more viewership, and with that divide and conquer, that's how they kind of uh, generate the kind of breaking news story, as we see, uh, see on CNN every 20 minutes, it's a breaking news story, yeah. but that's all, that's all bull crap, and it's all about just generating an audience and being sensational and not getting the larger picture of everything. Now, coming to just the Freddie Gray situation, uh, personally, from the evidence that I've seen, I think it's very compelling to think that there was a nickel ride. Uh, that happened to Freddie Gray. If people don't know what a nickel ride is, it's when police officers specifically put somebody in the back of a van, hogtie them, and then ride uh, extremely dangerous and extremely fast and make really stop, uh, fast stops so the person in the back get hurt. That's what I personally think after looking at all the conflicting reports, that's the most co kind of conveying kind of uh, information. We still don't know the full story. We can't say that for 100% fact, uh, but to me, especially with uh, the police changing their story and saying, okay, now there was four stops. Okay, there may be five stops. Okay, there's you know, maybe some camera here. Okay, we're not going to release the footage. Um, that's kind of um, where I'm kind of leading towards. But again, no definitive information can be said because the evidence is not there. Well, look, man, Walter Scott got shot and killed. All on video. They indict the officer. We didn't see any riding. Here's a guy who was killed in cold blood. He was running away, he was sluggish, slow, and what did the cop do? He just pulled out his gun, pop, 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 taking him down. We didn't see people in the streets with rocks, you know, lighting fires, because, first of all, there's a camera showing us what happened, and there was quick action by the government to hold this officer accountable. Now we have a situation where there's no camera evidence. We, we don't know what happened. We see them dragging a limp man into a van, and we're asking, why, why don't we have cameras in there? But now this guy is dead, and people are angry because they don't know. That's the biggest challenge. People here don't know what happened. They're angry. They want to see justice. They want to see someone held accountable for this man's death. If these officers are innocent, why, isn't, why don't they use more, why don't we have camera footage? Yeah. Why, don't, why, why wasn't the camera in the van? Yeah. And if they aren't, well then it makes sense why there's no footage of the van, well, but we really don't know. Well, according to the police, the camera in the van was not working, which kind of brings up the larger point of what everyone's kind of in the government and in the media kind of pushing is video cameras will actually change this. But as we know, just like from this situation, there was a video camera, but it was supposedly turned off. Officers will have that authority to turn off the video cameras and only use it when it benefits them. Of course, that's what people do when they have that power, uh, and it's not fully transparent. So I don't think that's a solution uh, as well. Here's the thing, man. The good cops, who we pretty much don't need to film, they're going to keep those cameras rolling no matter what's going on. They're the good cops. The bad cops, the ones we want to film, well, they're bad cops, right? It stands to reason that the bad cops will just turn the camera off. So you know, what we really need is we need people out in the streets with cell phone cameras. We need people who aren't afraid to stand up and film. Look, you know, we, we saw a video come out recently where a cop grabbed a woman's phone and smashed it. That's terrible. But someone else filmed it happening, right? So now we saw it happen. So people with cell phone cameras doing live streaming, recording, and sharing that 
is going to be what it takes to have those held accountable who yep. need to be held accountable. And the more of us that film, the more truth we will bring and it won't be stopped because there's so many of us just shining that light on that darkness and we're seeing a lot of darkness, but also we're seeing this kind of riot be um, unlike any other riot before, similar to kind of Ferguson, but right now there's so many video cameras, there's so many different angles, there's so much accountability that um, it's, it's, you know, even with the biases, you still get a full picture of everything that's happening, which is important. The problem with surveillance is, the, is that the idea is one special interest, one private organization, one government controls all that information. So we need to use what's called surveillance. That's where no one can control the flow. And that means when someone tries to do something wrong, everyone else is filming. And there's no, there's no special group, there's no individual who's going to be able to hide that footage. With surveillance, if you know, something benefits the, the special organization or the government, then they're going to show that footage. If it doesn't, Oh, the camera was broken. There's also a very interesting argument developing uh, kind of around everybody when it comes to riots. Many people are saying without these kind of riots, no one would have known about Freddie Gray. No one would have known about all the other deaths that are happening because if there is a death, just like we've seen uh, with the police officer shooting uh, the guy in the back when he was running away, because that officer was un automatically held accountable, there was no rioting, there was no kind of uh, outcry for justice. People are saying now that this rioting is kind of a voice for the voices. Now, of course, there's nothing in any way, shape, justifying the destruction of private property, of beating up other people, of you know beating up other journalists like we've seen here and the horrible atrocities that happened here. But what do you think of uh, the discussion that's happening now in the larger kind of media saying that we need riots because if we don't riot, we're not going to be heard? We'll just look at the cold, hard facts. There's, there's very few people who are going to say a riot is a good thing. Obviously, there's some people who are like, woo, let's go riot, and they have a fun time. Most people don't like that idea, don't like it happening. But we do have to accept the fact that we don't hear about a lot of these things. People don't react, they don't care, there's no justice. But when the people came out and actually caused some destruction, they caught everyone's attention. That, that's not saying that's a good thing. That's not saying, I mean, I think undoubtedly, uh, I think it's definitely a bad thing. You know, there's stores here, there's small businesses, there's just people who aren't making a lot of money just trying to sell pizza, who have just lost everything. But you know, the problem is no one listens. And so what happens is people get angry, and so they say, I'm going to make you listen. And they come out and they set fires. Yep. Uh, one activist made the argument here saying, you know, the broken windows could be fixed, but the broken, shattered lives can't be brought back in any way, shape, or form. Um, and, and what we're kind of seeing is this kind of emotional reaction saying the system's racist, these police officers are racist. We're going to be just as racist as they are. And we're seeing this kind of emotional kind of backlash happening, which is not justified in any way, shape, or form, because violence and negativity only creates more violence, and it creates this big circle loop that we're all engulfed. In, and it's very hard to make sense and we don't even pledge to even know exactly what's happening here we're just giving you what we're seeing in the kind of overall picture well that was Luke Rutkowski and I would I would advise you to subscribe to his YouTube channel it's wearechange.org on YouTube because what will happen is YouTube will give you his newest videos and he's pretty much on top of the issue and I trust his information. So I would do that. But anyway, the reason I played that is because I wanted to give you an example of the concerns on that level. Uh, plenty of variables and plenty of biases, conflicting information. And of course, people will take one side or the other depending on you know how they see it, how they call it, what the, how they're educated, what they've seen on TV. And uh, the fact that no one would have known it if they hadn't rioted, I think we can get information out a little bit better than that because the rioting, as you will see as we move to the next level, plays right into their hands. It's certainly not something that is good for our side, if you, if you mean humanity and humanness. On that level, we're looking for uh, who's at fault, and, you know, on the, on the surface, it looks like an oppressed minority, police overreaction, government trying to calm them down and sort things out. This is, this is what it looks like on the surface. This is what it looks like to the mainstream. Now, Luke isn't the mainstream, and he's certainly got more things into consideration than even the mainstream will give you. But that's the micro level. When you look at these events, if you look at the Boston bombing, 
uh, Sandy Hook. They take you right to the micro level, the smallest level, and they'll punch out a story that serves their purposes. And the purposes, to understand the purpose, we have to move to da da da, the next level, the forest level. We need to back up and find out what's really going on and why these things were orchestrated to, to occur. Now, because it's, um, I call this the Hunger Games level, because it's puppeted slaves versus puppeted slaves. I consider everybody on the planet kind of a slave because we all work for money, we all pay taxes. When you pay taxes, that kind of puts you down as being a slave to the government. Because if you don't pay taxes, they'll either put you in a cage or take some drastic action that'll end up putting you in a cage. So it's slave puppeted by controllers. Master controllers uh, inciting discontent on one side, encouraging violence by the police on the other, overly arming police. Now police are armed like, well, they're armed like the military uh, people that attacked Iraq, attacked Libya. They're, they're not paramilitary anymore. They're, they're actually military. Now, for the controllers to orchestrate something like this, they're orchestrating this to get to a bottom line, to get to an end point. And the end point is they want even tighter and stricter control over their slave population. They want to ratchet down. They want total surveillance. They want federal police to be the only people that are armed and can take any kind of action because they want to issue in a thing called the New World Order. And I'm sure that if you're listening to this podcast, you're very aware of what the New World Order is and what that entails. It involves a one-world government where they call all the shots. They say who lives and who dies. So let's, let's, let's move in a little bit on these two, on who our teeths are. Now, the, the controllers are puppeting these different factions. And they're puppeting the government, government officials who are making the decisions that seem to be orchestrating what's going on. The mayor of Baltimore seemed to say that she was allowing portions of her city to be vandalized and overrun by looters. She seemed to say that. Of course, found out today that she is part of Obama's team on how they're going to roll out this police state, how they're going to roll out the... See, what they want to do is they want to take the arms away from the police because they want to show the police as being overly violent and irresponsible. And anybody that doesn't report directly to the New World Order, directly to the overseers, are not going to have guns and not be able to arrest people, not be able to, to actually function as the, as the controllers. So what they've done is they've, um, they've overarmed the police and they've put them in situations where they're, they're um, probably encouraged to be violent. They certainly have more arms than, than they used to need. And and now they're rolling out as being a problem, as much a problem as the rioters are. Let's look at a couple of the different teams or the different sides that they've created in this conflict. Now, to control people or, or to issue in the New World Order, they're, they're using two basic tactics. The one tactic is divide and conquer. So we've forgotten that we're all a human race and we're all together into this. And now we've been divided into, in this case, the police, the white people in the neighborhood, uh, the government, and the black people. And those three, now they're, they're puppeted by the controllers to play their different roles so that 
they can justify bringing in the New World Order. So they, they use divide and conquer. And even within these groups, as I'll explain in a minute, they're divided. But one of the, one of the ways that they control the world is through divide and conquer. The other way is by a tactic called the Hegelian dialect, which is problem, reaction, solution. So they create a problem. And the problem in this case is police brutality. The reaction is uh, the city is up in arms and rioting. And the solution is to bring in federal police state to calm things down and hold things together. And what they want to do is they want to create such a large problem in this case so that the people in that area ask for the New World Order. They ask for the federalized police to take care of things. So between divide and conquer and problem, reaction, solution, they're orchestrating in their plan for a New World Order. Now, a New World Order, if you're in the streets of Baltimore and you're seeing what's happening and the New World Order seems to be offering peace and stability, you might, you might say, hey, let's have some of that New World Order peace and stability. But what it is, it's a total surveillance state. And you can see that coming in. You know that your you know that your emails are monitored. You know that your phone calls are monitored. You know that they have surveillance techniques. They can see right through your walls and watch what you're doing. They can actually capture you all the time in the, the total surveillance state. And the police state is going to make sure that you don't do anything. You don't think about doing anything that would disrupt the continuity of the new New World Order and, and how that's going on. So let's look, at some, let's look at some of the teams that they're puppeting right now. First one I want to talk about is the police. Now the police is it's a special kind of, I think, intellect that is attracted to police work. Uh, they have to be pretty obedient. Now, we're all trained, really trained, to be obedient slaves through school. You never get reinforced for thinking outside the box. You get reinforced for regurgitating the information that they gave you and being obedient, lining up, going to the bathroom only when you're asked. And a lot of these people are, a lot of the people in police are ex-military, where they're given that indoctrination even on another level. So they're very obedient slaves. They're doing it for money. In my experience, some police are very honorable. They're people that are doing it because they're really working. They're, they're, they're the old peace officers. But many of them are very corrupt, like in the old uh, movie Serpico. I think that if you're in a, the bigger the city, probably the more corrupt the police are. And they're, and once you get involved in that, you're obedient to your master, but you also can be blackmailed because you've been, been corrupt, corrupted. So, so there you go for the police. They're also armed, which makes people more dangerous and could make them jumpy. They have non-lethal weapons like the taser, which is, it's, it's a, it's a non-lethal weapon that they kill people with consistently. And they're probably irritated by constant struggle with the environment, the people in the environment, because they're not taught to be police officers anymore talking the beat. They're responding to crisis situations all the time, and it's, and they're, they're fearing for their lives. God bless them. I mean, they're, um, it's really, it's really a tough job, and they're in a really difficult situation. Also, they keep them divided. There's no consistent police unions, no strong police unions. There are police unions. The control system doesn't like unions because it creates a block that can stand against the controllers. So starting off in the, the 19th century with the Ludlow Massacre where where the Rockefellers shot up a camp full of miners to end the strike. 
Why, and going, going back through the Reagan administration where he broke up the Air Traffic Controllers Union by just breaking the strikes. I mean, so, so police, it's like they're, they're kind of, it seems like a block, but they're not a block because there's a lot of different factions and a lot of different, different moralities within that police. But they certainly are obedient to the demands of the controllers. Another side that's not talked about much are the whites. Uh, there's a pretty pretty wealthy communities around ba uh, Baltimore, and you know it's it's there's a lot of white people there, but they're divided up purposely by the controllers. Uh, there's the more conservative type that watch CNN. There's the more liberals that watch MSNBC and NPR. Conservatives, Fox News, then they're divided into religions. And then there's racial identity. Uh, when I grew up in, I grew up in Pittsburgh a long time ago, back in the 50s and 60s. And we were all, uh, it's a melting pot. So when the first thing you would ask someone when you met them is, what are you? Hey, not even what race are you or, or where are you from, is what are you? And you'd say, well, I'm German, or I'm Jewish, or I'm Polish. And uh, that identity was as strong as the, the racial identity between blacks and whites. And in most big cities, there were sections. There was a section where the Jewish community was. There was a section where the black community was. I can remember going into the Polish section of Pittsburgh, and I wanted to get some bread, and I went to a bakery, and I like this type of Syrian bread. I said, do you have it? Thinking that he's a baker, he probably makes several different types. No, he was offended. He said, why would I have Syrian bread? This is a Polish bakery. <laughs> so we've been taught from our, our European experience where they, you know, they, they, they had the French people fighting the English over and over again down through the years. The Germans resented the, the French. They kept them divided so that they could be puppeted into these wars all the time. So that even even splashed over into my, my upbringing growing up. So whites are anything but a, but a block, but they can be puppeted because of their subgroups very easily. And they're puppeted by TV a lot. Let's talk about the most important group here. Uh, we're going to call them the blacks. Now, they feel like they were cheated, and I think they have a really right to think that way. Uh, they were uh, aggravated for centuries. There's a lot of uh, slavery mythology about them being kidnapped and brought over here, and it's not all mythology. It actually happened. They usually admit the part, the part where they were mostly abducted by other blacks, brought over, and the fact that there were many, many white slaves, actually including my uh, grandfather's brother was brought over as, a, as an indentured around the turn of the uh, 20th century. And down through the years, we, we worked for equal rights. I mean, I can remember marching for civil rights back in the uh, late 60s. 1969, we got the Civil Rights Act passed, which is a blessing and a curse. You know, what we needed to do is understand that we're all one race, and it's called the human race. But what they did is they created a Civil Rights Act, which falsely superimposed um, other races into normal homogeneous type environments. So you were forced to higher blacks or Asians or, or Native Americans. And this is great in one way because it does, it did give us exposure to all the other cultures, but it was negative in another way because it caused resentment. You know, there was tokenism and they'd say, well, <laughs> it, was just, it was just a double-edged sword for that. Now we've got ourselves involved in what, they, what I'm going to call the diversity industry. Now, this industry is probably big and as powerful as the in military-industrial complex because there's a lot of people 
There's thousands of people that work in this industry to make sure that the Civil Rights Act is enacted, that people aren't cheated, and now that people don't say things disparaging on, on the Internet. And part of this industry involves people, uh, representatives like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, uh, who are flown in immediately when there's ever a politically, politically touchy situation where blacks are involved to actually go in and stir up the pot. Now, I just heard about a new organization. You're going to love this one. It's called Hands Up United. And it's a slick organization with slick websites. It's an international organization, and they're linking up with people in Brazil and all over the world. And when you see something like this emerging out of nowhere with all this money, you know it's being backed by the controllers to create problems and puppet, puppet you again. If you're in Hands Up United, you're being puppeted by George Soros because Hands Up United is a subdivision of George Soros' Open Society Institute. Now, you know George Soros. George Soros is, oh, I think he's a demon. He's the one that started the Black Lives Matter thing that was, that they couldn't get started in Starbucks but they're still carrying li uh, uh, banners around. This organization is just to stir up problems. Black lives do matter. Everybody's lives matter. But this is a, is a ploy to create problems. George Soros is the guy that funded the Ukrainian revolution. He, they overthrew a, threw a democratic uh, elected government and then went in and raided the entire treasury. They put in a puppet mobster, and then they raided the treasury. They took, all the, they took all the gold from the Ukraine. This is the kind of thing that George Soros does. And so he's responsible for Hands Up United. If you are a minority and you seem to be attracted by this organization, you're going to be puppeted and used as a ploy in this Hunger Games uh, orchestration by the New World Order. I also want to talk a little bit about race. There's a very old quote by a man named Seneca the Younger, and it goes, quote, Religion is regarded by the common people as true, by the wise as false, and by the rulers as useful, end quote. Now, I submit that race is exactly the same thing. Common people believe it. People that really know what's going on know that it's a ruse. But it's very, very useful. So the illusion of the black race, the white race, and all that is kept going, uh, there is only one human race. We all we all can interbreed with one another, and we create uh, fertile offspring. That's what, a, ra that's what a, uh, a species does. We're one species. It's, it's like a dog. I know a lot about dogs and dog training stuff because it's one of my hobbies. It's like, you know, dogs are the same as wolves, except they're domesticated. And we bred them so that they look different. Some of them are tall, some of them are short, some of them have a really strong bite, some of them are just cute and cuddly. And it would be like uh, all the beagles turning against all the wiener dogs. Or maybe that's a little ridiculous. But that's, that's how inane it is. I mean, we can breed together, we can create beautiful people together, actually, and I've seen it. Now, what I could do with my dogs, uh, since I know a little bit about dog training, I could train them to resent and hate one another. So whenever my, my Sharpe saw a beagle, he could become incised. I can do that. And that's what they did to us. They've created situations where we feel like if you see somebody with a little darker skin or somebody that's 
very short. You know, we've, we've been taught, we've been puppeted so that we could be turned against them very easily because they use divide and rule, divide and conquer all the time, and they need to do that. So that's why they have to keep us thinking that there is such a thing as race. Now, I have a kind of an interesting story here. This is a personal account, and I would love it if somebody who hears this broadcast and lived this personal account the same way I did would get in touch with me because this is, a, this is probably one of the most fascinating stories I've ever lived. And I would really like to even know more than I do about it. In the 1970s, I took a job in a place in Maryland, coincidentally, called, called Charles County. Now, this is a county that's kind of southeast of Washington, D.C. It kind of sticks out into the Chesapeake Bay. I took this job in the 70s, and most of the people there, or a lot of the people there, a segment of the population, was a group called, that called themselves the We Sorts, and I'll explain why they got that name in a little bit. It seemed that there were four families that came over and populated that area in around the 1630s, and now I'm saying 1630s. So by the time I got there, they had experienced 350 years of being there. And the, the family's names were the Swans, the Proctors, the Thomases, and I believe the other, the other name of the family were the Johnsons. I could be wrong on that one. And they brought uh, slaves over, and I think most of the slaves were black because of the, what I'm going to tell you later. And these people lived for 350 years together in this small area. Now there were Native Americans there, and they all interbred. So the Native Americans, the slave race, probably mostly black, and the Swans, the Proctors, the Thomases, and maybe the Johnsons, spent 350 years just as a community intermarrying. And they didn't seem to have, to hold the racial division Strong. They were like the Portuguese in Brazil. They were, uh, they found the the black women attractive. They found the white women attractive. They found, you know, it was it was just interbreeding for 350 years. Now, by the time I got there, they had become a separate race. The incident of albinos in this population was higher than than normal, and but there were some very extremely beautiful people. I can remember one woman, she looked like Cher Bono, except she had very dark skin and sky blue eyes, and she was one of these products of this, this division. Now, down through the years, these people lived together, and there was no mention of right, race. They, they farmed. Uh, they, they had farmed. They, they moved along what they called the Tobacco River, which had subsequently dried up. There was no racial division. And then in the 20th century, there were certain programs that affected other people in, in the community. I think they were probably under Roosevelt, and they would benefit certain segments of the population, but they wouldn't benefit this group. So the, the uh, story is they benefited those sorts and those sorts, but what about we sorts? So they got the name we sorts. So there was this population of we sorts down there that really had no race up until World War II. Now, in World War II, there were two separate armies. There was the White Army and the Black Army, and they both have recruiting stations in Charles County. Now, what happens is recruitment works on quotas so that the White Army has a certain quota, the black army has a certain quota. And when the black army can't reach their quota, they'll take some of these people. When the white army has, fails to meet their quota, they'll take some of these people. So some of them were black and some of them were white. Some of them were brothers. The brother was white, the other brother was black. Because they, they looked all different. Uh, 
Some were lighter, some were darker, some were freckle-faced, some were red-haired, some were, uh, some were red-haired with kinky hair, some were black, straight hair. Remember, it's a ra mixture of, of three races. And I can remember living in Brazil a couple of years ago, just being astounded at how beautiful the interracial people were. Well, I had the same thing in Charles County. So their racial identity was only given to them by the recruitment arms of the army. So when I worked there, it was really important because it was in the 70s after the Civil Rights Act, we had to have an accurate count of who was white and who was black and who was Native American. So every year we had to take the count. Now I had taught in other places before. And usually you, you just, you know, you'll do the racial count while they're reading something, you know, at your desk, you'll just mark it off because you can tell. In Charles County that wasn't the case. They had to raise their hands because a white looking person would be black, black looking person might be white. You couldn't tell, you had to, you had to ask. And there was another thing we were doing. It seems you get a certain amount of money from the, the state government or the federal government, I don't know which it was, for having minorities. You got a certain amount for whites, a certain amount for minorities, but you got more money for Indians. So if any of these people could show, or we could find out, that they could trace uh, their grandparents as being a, more of a purebred, then we could categorize them as being a Native American and get more money. So we were always looking for Indians. We were always on an Indian hunt. It's, it was a strange deal. And when we'd find an Indian, no matter what race he would be, we'd change it to Native American. <laughs> so you could get more money. So we could get more money. So not only did these people, the only reason they had race in the beginning was because of the army, and now we would change it based on the funding that we wanted to get from the government. So it was a weird situation and it was like, it made me know how ridiculous the idea of race was. Now, there was, um, there was a welfare culture there and the welfare culture included blacks and whites. And, you know, I used to think that was a great thing. I used to be really liberal minded on that, but I've, I saw that the, the kids would drop out of school early. The women, w the young girls would have themselves impregnated early because you can get money if you have children. So when you're 13, 14 years old, I was told this. Now, I don't know whether this is true or not. I was told that there were men that would impregnate, impregnate women kind of on a contract to get a percentage of the welfare check for the subsequent children. I mean, it might only be five five dollars a month, but these these kind of guys would just be, they'd be mostly, I don't know, they'd fish for a while or do this and that, and then they'd, they'd collect, catch these things. Now, I'm not sure of that, but I, I did know that the, the welfare state was not a good thing for them. There should have been some other plan. You know, you can't uh, shut people off without a way to support themselves, but... And then I was reading the other day an article on race, and I thought this was interesting. This is written by a guy named Bert Thomas, Ph.D. And Bert Thompson, Ph.D., writes an article called The, what is, er, the Origin of Races and What is Race? Um, I'm reading from the article. A human race is defined most often as a group of people with certain features in common that distinguish them from other groups of people. If I was going to talk about, I'm off of the article a minute. If I were going to talk about dogs, I'd say short-haired and long-haired or um, hunting dogs. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of that in name. Back to the article. Currently, there are three or four major races of humans as the world race is commonly, as the word race is commonly defined. A, the Astrioloid, Astrioloid, the Caucasoid, the Mongoloid, and the Negroid. 
Generally speaking, the astrioloids are considered a subgroup of the caucasoids simply because the two groups have so many features in common. So the aboriginals are considered whites in this thing, even though they're more black than blacks, and many people feel that um, black people populated South America from Australia, and, and of course they would be black then. It gets really crazy. Caucasoid is 55%, Mongoloid 33%. I don't know where they got these. World's population. Negroid is 8%, Astro Astrialoid is 4%. And if you're in America, it's really hard to find purebred of anything because we've been interbreeding, especially with blacks, for, for hundreds of years, actually. The legend goes that the slave owners, if they were white, would breed with the black slaves because when you interbred a white and a black, you would get a ma uh, uh, mulatto. A mulatto, right. And the mulatto would be worth a little bit more money than just the black with black. And if you would breed the mulatto with the white, you would get a mesquite, which is worth a little bit more money. That's how crazy it is. So I think that in the United States, it would be very hard to find a black person. I mean, a Negroid. Negroid. So they're all in a race, in a, intermixed. And I would say much the same for the white race, too, there. Because we came out of Africa. Let me go back to the article. There are many more differences among people than just their hair texture, skin color, and facial features. Dozens of other variations have been found to exist. The following examples are taken from blah, 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 blah. Here's a difference. The apocrine glands, which produce scents that we commonly refer to as body odor, vary widely among the races. Asians have extremely low distribution of apocrines. Koreans are among the least odor-producing people on Earth. 50% of them have no apocrine glands at all. With regard to other races, blacks have slightly higher distribution of apocrine glands than whites. And that's, a, that's an important distinction for me. And then, of course, there's earwax among races. is quite different. One of the most accurate ways to distinguish Asians from blacks and whites is to check for differences in earwax. Asians produce dry, crumbly earwax. Blacks and whites produce moist, adhesive earwax. What a bunch of nonsense. It's totally nonsense. So maybe they should have known that in the wee sorts. They could have used some of those distinctions to determine what race they were. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hate you, and I'm going to discriminate against you because you have more earwax. Your earwax is a problem for me. <laughs> uh, metabolic rates did can differ significantly among races. And then the higher metabolic rate, the higher the threshold for sensing cold. The Eskimos' metallic, uh, metabolic rate is 15 to 30 percent higher than that of a European. Equatorial people have the lowest metabolism of all because the fewer calories are needed to keep their bodies warm. And also they're they seem to be smaller. <laughs> so so these are these are the important things. I mean I, I have more differences between dogs I've I've had than than this nonsense. Continuing with the article. Despite the human species wealth of built in variation and despite our constant references to race, no one ever has been able to suggest a truly reliable way to distinguish one race from another. That's because there's only one race. There's the human race. And, and I'm sorry, but, but race is bullshit. I mean, if you're, if you're a racist and you really are a white supremacist or a black supremacist, you're being puppeted into that because it's not true. There's one race. Look, 
And we're, we're a race of species. We're an amazing race. We're compassionate, we're loving, we're warm, we're, we're open, we're creative. We're a great race, but our race is in danger. Not the white race or the, or the yellow race or, or any of these other stupid earwax divisions. We're one race and we're struggling sur for survival right now. Don't allow yourself to be puppeted by race. I mean, you, it's, it's, it's foolish. I don't care um, who's doing it. I think personally we're oppressed by a predatory species that's hardly human and it's holding us captive and manipulating us. And we'll get into that as we, as we pull back and see more, even more than the forest, and we see the landscape. Now uh, these, this, this captor race, which isn't a race, it's, it's like a hybrid race because they're, they're part human, but they're missing the compassion, they're missing the creativity, uh, they're missing a, a lot that makes us human. They're psychopaths at best, and I say this a lot on this show and I won't take it back, and demons at worst. We're an oppressed race of loving, compassionate beings, and we're artificially imposed in an environment of fear, that's interfering with our evolution of consciousness. And that leads me to the next level. But before we move on, I want to remind you that if you're working on the micro level, like, um, like Luke described, and you're unaware of the next level, the forest level, you're going to be misled. You have to realize who the players are that there's humans and then there's controllers and the controllers have an objective and they care very deeply about that objective and they work it's it's the total it's it's the total obsession with their lives is to get this new world order in and they've got to puppet you into getting this new world order if we can unite together we can become free people together hand in hand blacks and whites and all this other bullshit racial divisions, the long nose and the, and the flaky earwax people, we're all together and we can rise above this. But we have to rise above this and, and this will become more and more obvious as we move into the next levels. The next level I call the landscape level. It's like the forest, the meadows, the cities. And this is about the Civilization 2.0. This is the new civilization that's being created under our noses without our, without our awareness. And this is important because this, is, this plays in with and, and brings to mind a lot of the other players that are involved in here. Not just the psychopathic demons and the human race. There are, there are other entities involved. Now, on these first two levels that we've done in this hour, it's, it, anybody totally left-brained can understand and see what's going on. You just have to wake up and be aware. It doesn't uh, take any faith or any trusting or any logical, you know, A plus B equals C kind of thing. It doesn't require any logic. The next type of steps require... Uh, understanding metaphors, understanding allegories, and putting things together to make sense out of what's happening. Now, there, Richard Dolan, a couple years ago, came up with a concept called the breakaway civilization. And it's just a logical conclusion based on his studies. Now, he's a, he's a UFO researcher, but he's much more than that. And we'll hear from him later on in the broadcast. He's much more than that because he is very intelligent. And he's able to piece things together and logically conclude what's going on. He's not just uh, somebody who wants to describe the greys or something like that. He, he really sees the big picture. And he came up with this concept called the breakaway civilization. Now, this is just a logical deduction. From what's going on. Let's go back to 
let's say, let's go back to 1940s. And if you've read any history of UFOs, you know that there were plenty of documented UFO crashes in the New Mexican desert during that time. They were mostly associated with um, and happened around Manhattan Project sites where they were experimenting with atomic bombs, where they were experimenting with a particularly strong type of radar. And there's plenty of documents that show that there were alien craft or uh, at least strange craft with strange beings on them that were shot down or crashed in the desert. And there's plenty of evidence, documented evidence, in addition to people coming forward, even though their lives were threatened by the government, have come forward many times on their deathbeds to attest to the fact that this happened. Well, these crafts had incredibly advanced technology. And I'm not even going back to, I don't even need to go back to the Vril craft that, that Hitler had perhaps during World War II. We can just start with 1948 with the, cra with, the, with the Roswell crash or the other crashes that happened at that time. Now let's say that you're uh, a general and of course you're, if you're a general you're totally obedient and you're totally puppeted by the control system. And you capture one of these crafts and you get one of these crafts and, and it has incredible technology, technology that allows you to levitate, go at incredible speeds, uh, turn. It, the, the, uh, the technology that you would get would just be, well, literally out of this world. So what you do with that technology is you don't go back and make it public, just like they didn't make the Tesla technology public. They keep it private. And when they keep it private, they back engineer it. That means they find out how it works by taking it apart and looking at it. And also, the way science works is when you have a certain breakthrough, other breakthroughs are built upon those breakthroughs. So if you've, if you've got a wheel, then you can make a cart, then you can do other things. But without the wheel, the people without the wheel are stuck where they are. We, as the human population of the Earth, of the, as the human race, We've been driving internal combustion engines since the 1850s. That's when it was invented. It actually didn't take off until the 1870s when the Standard Oil companies and the Rockefellers got involved and they wanted to sell oil. That way it became really popular and it's been popular ever since and oil has been a form of enslavement. Meanwhile, the breakaway civilization with all this new technology have been building on and building on and building on. Some people estimate that they're 40 years ahead. Some people estimate that this breakaway civilization is perhaps a thousand years ahead. I would have to say that I'm probably closer to, we're probably closer to a thousand years ahead. But before we get any further into this, let's take a quick break and we'll be back for another hour. Welcome back. It's good to have you sticking around for the second hour. When we ended the last hour, we were talking a little bit about the breakaway civilization or civilization 2.0, whatever you want to call it, and 
how they've used and hoarded the technology and kept it from us. Um, we're, our, technology, the, our technology is rationed out. It's rationed out to control us. I mean, we burn coal in coal plants. 100 years after te Tesla technology was invented and started to be used by by the breakaway civilization. Actually, they use it in, they use it in the Philadelphia Project. They use it in the HAARP projects, which control the climate, I suspect set off the Fukushima disaster, and they use it, they're using it up to, to dry up California right now. The HAARP, powered by Tesla technology, which they've had for 100, 100 years, hundreds of years. That's why the idea of climate change is so preposterous to me because I know that there are thousands of patents that could be released tomorrow that would eliminate the need for any carbon other than our breathing. If carbon's a problem, I don't, I don't believe it is, but there is certainly plenty of technology that would take us out of the need to burn fossil fuels, that's for sure. That's why the idea of disclosure, you know, disclosure, what, what's going on with the aliens around here? That's preposterous too, because the people that, the people that people would trust to disclose have a vested interest in only telling you what they want you to know. Actually, we heard, a, heard an interesting talk, I can't remember who it was by, but they were talking about disclosure. You know, this is now disclosure in this context means disclosing whether there are what are we going to call them aliens, extraterrestrials around, and whether they're benevolent or whether they're not. And first of all, we as human beings could find out and totally understand what they're all about. And we're going to understand a little bit after we, as, as I explain as we go on in this hour. But me telling you about the aliens doesn't wash for most people. Most people need an authority figure, like a government official or a mainstream media person to come on and say, yes, there are gray aliens and they mean you no harm. Earth, Earth people, you know, because unless it's told by an official source, it's really strange. Most people won't believe it. Most people are locked into this paradigm where they're sheep, where they'll only believe what the government and the media tells them. So the media can manipulate this topic, and they're going to make you do whatever they, they want to with this topic. They're not going to tell you any more than they have to. Actually, I think if they would disclose what they knew, it would be a new dawn for all of us. And I'll try to disclose as much as I know as we get on, as we get more and more into the right brain. Now, remember that a couple couple podcasts ago, I was talking about Stuart Swerdlow, who was on with Freeman Fly, and he's a uh, he's an MK Ultra person. He was involved with the Montauk Project, and he still has deep connections into that world. And Stewart seems to indicate, well, he actually said that there could be a staged alien invasion in September. He was predicting that. And so if there is an alien invasion, it'll probably be orchestrated by the uh, psychotic overlords for some purpose, probably since they're so intent on this new world order, it'll probably add to the chaos of perhaps the falling dollar, um, Jade Helm, and all the other craziness that's happening in the United States and throughout the world. So there's this breakaway civilization, if you believe that, or Civilization 2.0. There's plenty, I think, there's plenty of evidence. Actually, David Icke tells a story about um, a person that he knew that had cancer. And this cancer patient was working on a very important project 
for the psychopathic overlords. And he was the only person that could do it. And he was going to die before the project was completed. So the way David describes it is they gave him a vial of medicine that he drank. And two or three days later, the cancer was gone. Of course, we've done programs on cancer and there are plenty of cures for cancer. Unfortunately, chemotherapy and radiation aren't two of them. Uh, but they are not they, two of them. Are not two of them. Mm -hmm. Right, so they keep, they keep things back from us. And uh, there's plenty of crafts that are seen over Area 51 that are unidentified that could be part of this breakaway civilization. They have incredible holographic technology where they can create anything in the sky, they could create an, an incoming uh, bombers, they can create incoming bombers, or they can create a messiah in the sky. And at the same time, they have the technology where they can put sounds in your head, so it sounds like that messiah is talking directly to you. Right. So, there's plenty of evidence that that this is that this is that this is a reality that this breakaway civilization is true now the end game for the society is to robotize the population that they need now they also will probably keep a batch of people because they use people to uh, harvest organs do their satanic rituals and, and that kind of stuff and reproduce more and humans. reproduce more humans um, so they might keep a few, but the idea is to to perhaps leave the planet, perhaps go underground, because they seem to be destroying the the earthly environment here with the geoengineering and the chemtrails and the fluoride in the water and the fracking and all that stuff. It doesn't sound like they want to keep you know God's creation here going. They want to destroy it and move on and with the technology they have, they feel they can move to other planets. And they might be able to because this technology was just not back engineered by them. On some occasions, it was given to them by other entities that we're going to talk about later. But before we get into that part, I want to talk about two concepts that will lead us into the next level, which is the intergalactic level. Let's talk about human evolution and human involution. Now, by evolution, I don't mean that, you know, we were once a monkey and we evolved into humans and we're going to evolve into, I don't know, I don't know whatever, whatever physical being we're going to evolve from. As far as I'm concerned, that doesn't happen, never has happened, because there's a thing called genetic homeostasis that keeps different species within a range of mutations. When you get outside of that range, a species stops being able to reproduce or goes back to the original shape of the original species. It happens in dogs, it happens in every species, and we have genetic homeostasis too. So we're not going to physically evolve into something different. Now, the breakaway civilization, civilization 2.0, the demonic overlords, they do genetic manipulation now so they can create any type, I suppose, any type of being that they want to create. But in terms of natural evolution, we are evolving, but we're evolving on a consciousness level. We're learning. We're in the shape of a human. We're part of the human race because we're evolving, we're learning, we're expanding, we're becoming more knowledgeable, we're becoming a more wise being. So that's evolution, that's human evolution, and it's happening, you can see it all around you. People are waking up, people are becoming more and more identifying with the people who are in trouble. It's an amazing thing to live through, and I'm sure we all signed up to come here to watch this amazing transformation that the human race is happening. The opposite of evolution is involution. 
where you're involved back to something less sophisticated. Now the dark forces, the overlords, the satanic psychopaths, are working on involving us back to a previous state. They've done it by genetic manipulation. We are now only two strands of DNA, where supposedly before we had many more. You can look at it as uh, a dumbing down process. If you, you look at... You also call it devolving? You could call it... be different? I don't know what that is. I guess it could be devolving. I call it involution because that's what most people call it. Okay. We're involving... Uh, if you've ever seen the, the movie Idiocracy, it shows, it highlights uh, an involved, a devolved society where the people have become so dumb that they have to have everything done for them uh, and they, the, 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 the entertainment is really idiotic. I idiotic. It's, in, it's incredible and I can see that happening. If you take the words to popular songs of the 20s and 30s, and listen to the songs that are out now, you'll find the language is more sophisticated. Um, it's less overtly sexual. I mean, the sexuality of today is animal-like sexual. They want to involve us back to an animal state. So it's about booties and, and that type of sexuality. Whereas it was much more sophisticated 30, 40, no, not 30, 40. 70, 80 years ago. And the language is more sophisticated. The words are bigger and more complicated. There's no, there's no hiding the fact that they're dumbing down through education, through the media, through, through movies and music, our society. So there's a, a dark force working for our involution and our natural human evolution is kicking in, and you can see evidence all around you. That's the first concept I wanted to have you on board with. The second concept is the archons and the aeons. Now the archons, it means rulers. And during our stint in the physical environment here on Earth, the archons, which I think are also another name for our demonic, psychotic, rulers have been calling the shots and actually in a way giving us the experience of deep heavy-duty materialism and I think it's for our education myself personally but they're here and we need to evolve outside of their structure. We need to evolve around them. We need to oppose, we need to allow our natural awakening not to be start, stopped by the archonic involution pressure. Is that clear, pretty much? I think so. And then there's the aeons. Now the aeons are the good beings. They're kind of divine beings we could, we could actually call the Archons the Fallen Angels and the Aeons the Non-Fallen Angels. The positive, creative force that created us, created this whole situation for us to go through and are shepherding us in a way, as you'll find out later, through this thing. So there's the Archons and the Aeons and they're working for involution versus evolution. Okay. okay? Leads me to the next level. Da 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 da. <laughs> this is the intergalactic level, the Star Wars level, where are, there are other species involved and they're playing different roles in this drama. Now, remember, we started off with just being on the street in Boston and then Baltimore. we moved to Baltimore, sorry. And then we backed up and we saw that there is a puppeting force and it's slave versus slave. And if we're going to play the role of slaves, we're going to remain as slaves. So we have to evolve above that. 
Then we step back and we got a little bit closer look at the overlords and what they're trying to do with their Civilization 2.0 or their breakaway civilization. Now let's go back a little bit further and find out what are some other players involved in this thing. All right, lay it on us. Okay, here we go. Now, I don't know whether you guys are familiar with the disclosure project that was headed up by Stephen Greer before his death. Now, this project is, is interesting because, you know, I really like Stephen Greer, even though he's always worked for the Rockefellers. And the disclosure project is, was financed by Lawrence Rockefeller. Even when we went back to research the financing, we couldn't find the documents that showed that Lawrence Rockefeller financed this, but we could find the comments on the evidence. So we kind of deduced back from the comments on the evidence that there was evidence there. So it's a contrived, puppeted thing, but there was a military person there that said that, they've, that the U.S. has already identified 59 categorized species of aliens. And, of course, the Disclosure Project says that they're all benevolent. How could that possibly be? I don't think there's all benevolent humans, you know, so... But let's look at the reality of that, and let's just, let's just take a practical look at it. I know that I'm going more into the right brain, but I'm trying to be practical with it, too, without, and not leave a lot of people behind on this, this little trip. Let's look at biology and bugs. It seems to me that 15 years ago I was reading an article about the identification and the categorization of the species of bugs in the world. And a biologist estimated that only 50% of the bugs that are crawling around the world were identified and, and categorized. Okay. So there's 50% of them crawling around out there. We have no idea what kind they are or, or anything. So this is, this is biology. And this is something that biologists can study right here on the Earth. I mean, we can look at these, these bugs and we can categorize them, but we don't know what half of them are. Now, that's the bugs. Now, they were talking about the bugs that we can see with our naked eye. They weren't talking about the bugs that you can only see with a microscope. Have you seen those pictures of the little tiny bugs that are in your bed and things? You can't see them. But they're, they're, they're awesome looking little things, but you have to look at them under the microscope. And that's not a very powerful microphone, microscope. That's just a microscope microscope. You could get much more and more uh, species if you'd have a much more powerful microscope. So, and there's probably no end to the tininess you could get to identify more bugs. Okay. So... In biology, which we work on all the time to find more bugs and categorize more bugs, we still haven't even got half of them. Oh, we could see, let alone the ones that are beyond our seeing, smaller and smaller and smaller, let alone ones, bugs, that might be crawling around there that are perhaps interdimensional. Maybe they can't be seen by our little... You know, we can only see things in a small spectrum of light. Maybe there are things outside of our light in like another dimension or another reality or just vibrating differently so that we can't see them. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of bugs, we don't know what's going on. Right. And we deal with bugs all the time. Let's take that and think about the multiverse. Now, supposedly, according to Alfred Lambermont Weber, who we'll talk about a little bit later, there have been scientists working on how many universes there are in the multiverse. And one figure he gave, he says it's just humongous. He said that there are, he doesn't know the actual number. He said, but if you were to write the number, in 12-point pica type, that number would stretch 
what, 280, the number would be stretched 280 million miles. I think that's what he said, if I recall correctly. Right. So, so it's a pretty big multiverse. <laughs> yes. So imagine all the beings, as big as they could be, as small as they could be, in all the different dimensions running around out there. Since we can't even identify half of the bugs that we can see in natural light. So I think it's safe to say that there's a lot more folks, and I mean ET kind of folks, than 49, 59 categorized species. I think it's infinite. And there could be infinite numbers of motivations, infinite numbers right. of, of interests right. all out there. And isn't that kind of their modus operandi for disclosing things? When they disclose, they just give you a, a little piece of the information to distract you from the reality of how much larger it is. Exactly. That. Exactly. It's the tip of the iceberg thing we talk about all the time. Yeah. So they tell you about 59 of these that they've categorized. Who knows how many there are? Who knows how much they know? And and what they're doing and, and why they're doing it. Now let me go into a little bit of a description of how some researchers Category or would characterize our predicament on the planet. Now, not we're going way beyond our predicament by being puppeted by these overlords, by these demonic overlords. It doesn't take much investigation to find out that that's true. It doesn't find, take much logical thinking to understand that there's a breakaway civilization and that there are a lot of beings out there running around doing this and that and the other thing that may be influencing our situation also, in addition to the beings that are trying to work toward our involution. Are we straight so far? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to get too confusing. But there are researchers like Michael Tazarian and many others that say that, the, that, the, that, the, uh, that our Earth is in quarantine. In other words, we're separated from the rest of um, the multiverse because something's happening special on our planet. We're quarantined from perhaps infecting, perhaps polluting, or just perhaps we're uh, kept from getting off of our, our planet to take our little story of evolution further seems like there might be something that we need to learn here, and we're in quarantine for a while. Interesting. I've also heard that we're in a prison planet. Now, there's a lot of information now that's coming out about the planet Saturn and how the planet Saturn influences us here on Earth by way of the moon, obviously. Now, this is getting a little bit more right-brained. I hope you stick with us because it'll all, it all ends up on a happy note here. Saturn, many people are researching now into Saturn. Of course, we're vastly in, influenced by Saturn. Saturn is another name for Satan. Uh, Christmas is another name for Sat Saturnalia. Santa Claus, who dresses in red and black and white. Santa, Satan Claus. I mean, it's all around Saturn. And the symbols for Saturn are all around us. A major symbol for Saturn. Now, Saturn is also Kronos, means time. And you know we're bound by time. It's hard to get outside of time in our current environment. We live from one moment to the next. It evolves. You know, our, our time evolves, goes from one to the other. Kronos, time, is another name for Saturn. Now, one of the major symbols for Saturn is a cube. 
and you see cube symbols all around, you see it, if you look at corporate logos, you'll find, I think the cube is probably the most common sign in corporate logos. Also, it's the symbol for the Muslim religion. They bow to Mecca, and in Mecca is a giant cube. Uh, Christianity, their symbol is a cross. And if you're good at geometry, it doesn't take much folding of a, of a, of a cross made out of a piece of paper to make it into a cube. How that would work is the middle of the cross, where the uh, vertical piece meets the horizontal piece, is one side of the cube. Uh, one side of the horizontal piece would be another side of the cube. The other side of the horizontal piece would be the other side of the cube. The top part of the vertical piece would be another side of the cube. And the bottom piece, which is much longer, would be the other two parts of the cube. So the cross is also a Saturn symbol. Um, the Nike sign, the all-seeing eye, supposedly there is an eye type thing that goes out of the bottom of Saturn that's been observed. The top of Saturn is a hexagon. That's another Saturn symbol. The pyramid is another Saturn symbol. It's the controlling, and the pyramid of, on the, with the eye on the top, of course, is the most dominant Saturn symbol we have, and we have it on the money, which is a, really has, <laughs> the money is a talon, talon. It, talisman. Talisman, good. It's a talisman, and it's endowed with certain power that gives it spending power. And the mythology around that is we're controlled by money as well as by time. You know, they say time is money. Mm -hmm. How directed back to Saturn can you get? Right. Now, the cube also represents confinement in the prison. So you can look at our planet as being confined in a cube. In a cube. So we're kind of in a prison planet. Now, how does this line up with some other mythologies? Let's do the Christian Bible mythology. Now, in the mythology, the Christian mythology, I, th I guess it's the uh, Judeo-Christian mythology, the story of Adam and Eve. Adam, or, or Eve, is tempted by, oddly enough, a reptilian. Now, this reptilian turns out to be a snake. But apparently it was a snake that had arms and legs because one of the punishments that was levied onto this demonic figure of the snake was to take away its arms and legs. So it became a, a, sl a slithering little reptile rather than a uh, demonic... Walking around one. Reptile, yeah. <laughs> and tempted Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge. I mean, as, as you remember, God had forbid Adam and Eve from eating from this particular tree. But she was tempted by the snake to eat this. And subsequently, when they ate that, God threw them out of the, the Garden of Eden. So we, so we left the womb of the Garden of Eden, where we had an idyllic situation. You might be able to call it the Golden Age where everything was pleasant and light, and we threw ourselves into the materium. We threw ourselves into material existence. And we have been working on learning lessons in the material existence since that time, I believe. That's how I interpret the, the, uh, the story of Adam and Eve. And I think it works right into this. Wouldn't it also involve us being like trapped in a materium, trapped in a material existence until we learned certain lessons that we could get, only get from being in the material existence, dealing with these demonic entities and dealing with our own temptations, dealing with 
sexuality run amok, dealing with all the things that we deal with now. Money pressure, time pressure. It sounds like a, sounds like a good analogy for well, what we're going through and what we're going to try to evolve out of and what many of us are evolving out of. You can see it all around you. People are waking up to what's going on. They know they're being tricked by TV. They know, they know not to vote in the election because it's just a scam. They know these things. We're waking up. We're evolving. We're, we're leaving the materium, headed back toward the garden. Got to get back to the garden. I'd play that, but I'm afraid I'd get a copyright <laughs> in print. Well, it's not just the Christians or the Abrahamic religions. Also, the Yuga Cycles. Now, the Yuga Cycles, I don't know. I, I, that's, people are less familiar with the Yuga Cycles than that Christian Bible story. But in the Yuga Cycles, we spend time in four different ages. We spend time in the Sati Yoga, the Trenta Yoga, Treta Yoga, the Dwapara Yoga, and the Kali Yoga. And we go from the Golden Era, which is the Sati Yoga, which we spend most time in. And then we get more and more solid, less and less mystical. We get more and more into the materium as we get into the Kali Yoga, which is the deepest, darkest, heaviest thing. The Iron Age. The Iron Age. Yeah, well, they, you know, the Greeks had the same thing. It was the Golden, mm -hmm. Silver, Bronze Age, and then the Iron Age. And now we're coming up on it's a cycle, so it goes around. We go back up to the um, Dwapara, Treta, and then back into the Sati Yoga, which I think we'll go back pretty quickly if we can just uh, free ourselves from the archons who keep us down, held into this, this deep materialism, materialism, where we're subject to the whims of our controllers, which are these demonic entities, these fallen entities that seem to be dictating our existence, ruling us with money and time, all Saturn symbols, all symbols of Kronos. It seems pretty logical then, that there might be other entities, maybe aeons, which are the positive side of the archons, ions involved in maybe not helping our evolution, but definitely leveling the playing field so that we can evolve past the, this archontic um, matrix that we're in. There's a person that we refer to all the time, Alfred Lamberman Weber, who seems to agree with that. He seems to think that there are many alien species that are working to level the playing field. Now, let me tell you a little about Alfred. Alfred Alfred's a graduate of Yale University and Yale Law School, doctorate in law, Fulbright Scholar in International Integration, taught economics at Yale, constitutional law at the University of Texas. He's a general counsel of New York City Environmental Protection Agency. He's a futurist at Sanford Research Institute. Now, if you're a listener of the World Beyond Belief, you know that the Stanford Research Institute is a Tavistock Institute. Now, Tavistock is a mind control population manipulation arm of, of the control system. So that we might Take a minus on Alfred on that one. Directed the 1970, he had directed the 1977 Carter White House study of extraterrestrial communications. Uh, I give him a lot of credibility because he's uh, in the same boat we're in. He doesn't have a lot of money. He's really working to further, I think, to further information that people have about this, this, this area. He interviews people that couldn't otherwise get a voice. And Alfred has plenty of connections with people who, how can I say, are associated with beings that might be outside this world. And he's 
it's it's been his life work. Uh, he's he wrote the book Exopolitics, which is the study of politics throughout the multiverse, which is a fascinating book, by the way, if you get a chance to read it. But Alfred says that there are many ET species that are working constantly, fighting, actually battling with the archontic forces that control us and keep us in the matrix to not so much to free us, because I think we need to do that ourselves, but to level the playing field. And and some evidence of that is the fact that, well, I can remember back during the Vietnam War, Nixon wanted to use uh, atomic weapons. But for some reason, he couldn't get them to work. Nowadays, they're trying to touch off CERN, which could destroy the entire multiverse. But they don't seem to be able to get it to work. And it, it doesn't work for the strangest of reasons. I think the last time something like an owl or a baggie or something flew into something and fouled up the CERN reactor so they couldn't get it started. Now, CERN could, could blow everything. So there seems to be evidence that when, when big things are happening, maybe even Fukushima, it seems like the Fukushima disaster would be a lot more devastating, uh, maybe without the influence of these beings that are far beyond us. Also, I, I had confirmation of this the other day. We were listening to an interview by our old friend Richard Dolan, who we talked about earlier. Richard talked about observing the skies through high-powered night vision goggles. Let's play a little bit of that inter uh, discussion by Richard. One night there were a fellow with a couple of pairs of excellent quality night vision binoculars. So we decided we were going to do a night watch. And I was, I was there. It was a really nice group of people. It was just a couple of hours from 11 till a little after 1 a.m. Nice June evening in 2008. And uh, I have to say, now we have, uh, you know, we may be doing some night vision here at this event, I know. I was blown away. I was blown away by what I saw. It was, it was my first experience going through night vision in, in any kind of sophisticated way. And uh, I couldn't monopolize the binoculars the whole night, although I wanted to, but we all shared. Two hours, I probably saw about literally 100 objects going through the night sky that I would not have been able to see with the naked eye. And I can't remember exactly now, but <clears throat> a very high percentage of them, a very high percentage of these were really strange, really strange things. So, objects, super high altitude, going at unbelievably fast speeds. These are not meteorites. These are not space objects. These were, these were craft of some sort. Many of them were pulsating in a very rhythmical way, going at speeds that just astonished me. You've had for years and years, and again, Mike, Michael Schratt did a, a fantastic uh, discussion on some of these types of advanced uh, craft, what are often known as trans-atmospheric vehicles, I don't know, okay, take you to New York to Tokyo in a couple of hours, is it possible? Well, after that night, I thought, yeah, I think so. I think they're out there. There were objects that were, um, that seemed to be maneuvering. It was hard because we weren't recording anything and you're watching with, you know, through these binoculars and sometimes they're moving kind of quickly. What I can tell you is, it was like, you know that movie, um, They Live, where he put the special glasses on and you see the reptilian people behind the mask. Well, it was kind of like that, except it's with, that's what night vision does to the sky. It allows you to see a vastly different reality than what you would see, even on a clear night. Um, you can see much, much more. And so that really got me, that, that had certainly got my attention. So I guess there are things flying around up there, and there's a lot of action up there, which could kind of confirm what Alfred seems to indicate that there are beings working on our behalf. Maybe not to free us, but certainly to level a playing field so that we so that we can have it. So that we so that they're not so that the archons aren't doing things that are going to destroy our chance of getting out of this thing alive. 
It also squares with my research on consciousness. I, I have a PhD in consciousness studies, and I've written two books on the subject. And in higher levels of consciousness, one of the major characteristics is that your concept of self becomes incredibly huge. In other words, on lower levels of consciousness, it's just you and your body. That's all you're concerned about. That's all you care about. That's all you identify with. As you get larger, you identify with your family and perhaps your, uh, your county or your type. You might be a mill worker, so you identify with mill workers. You might identify with your religion or, or your race if you can believe that. And then it gets, it gets larger and larger. So you identify with all humanity. If it's happening to one human, it's happening to you. Your heart bleeds for the Palestinians for what they're going through. You identify with everyone. And as you, as you expand further, you identify with all consciousness on the earth and then all consciousness in the universe. You become incredibly huge. That's called expanding your consciousness. That's the biggest characteristic. <clears throat> Another characteristic, besides the fact that you identify with all the other beings and you feel their pain and you care about them, is that is, was, it's kind of a uh, caring non-attachment thing. You feel like the purpose of your life is to help others. The purpose of your life is to stop what's going on in Palestine. The purpose of your life is to stop what's going on in Baltimore. The purpose of your life is to, is to save the pain and suffering that's going on with other human beings. Now, there's a certain element of non-attachment, but it's not the traditional non-attachment that that you could read about in Eastern literature. It's not a non-caring at all. It's a deep caring, but non-attachment to the outcome of the caring. In other words, you're going to do what you can to help the situation, to solve the situation, but you're not attached to the outcome. You're going to allow the universe to unfold and do what it needs to. So it seems to me if there are advanced beings, they could be advanced human beings that are fighting to keep the playing field level. Now they're doing everything they can. They're risking their lives, actually, because they're fighting certainly ugly, demonic, ruthless creatures. But they're not attached to us being freed. You know, we'll free ourselves if we can free ourselves. So it makes sense that there, if there are beings in the universe that are f further evolved than we are, and how naive do you have to be to think that there aren't beings in the universe further evolved than you are? You have to be a moron. Of course there are beings in the universe farther evolved than we are, and certainly they would care about us, and certainly they would work on our behalf. But I think that they couldn't free us. Because let's say that uh, a group of beings come and destroy the archons and free us from our matrix. Well, on the earth right now, 75% of the people would whine about it. They wouldn't like it. They want to go back to Saturday college football games or they want to uh, they want to practice their sexuality they want to see how much money they can make see how many cars they can buy they're in the matrix and they don't see the matrix for what it is they they're they're still learning the fact that it's a trap they're learning that it's it's a matrix and they're in the matrix and they're not free. Their freedom is very limited. So there's a lot of people, let's say if Christos would come down 
and free everybody. I don't think we're ready. Or I don't think a lot of us are ready. I'm ready. Believe me, I'm ready. But I don't think a lot of us would be ready. So they're leveling the playing field. And what we need to do is wake ourselves up. We need to walk away from the matrix. We need to not engage in the Baltimore riots and not be tricked by the Texas false flag. We need to walk away. We need to realize what a wonderful species we are as human beings. We're compassionate. We're creative. We're wonderful. We've been sucked into this matrix for a lesson, but we've got the lesson. Okay, right, we've got it. We're out of here. But I think that's what's happening. Now, one of the, one of the uh, entities might be the Divine Christos. Now, the Divine Christos, according to the uh, Sophia mythos, is, a, is an aeon. One of the aeons that created us here on Earth. And if this being came back, it would certainly be the second coming of Christos, which would fulfill the, pro the, the biblical prophecies. I think if you're expecting a human, I don't know, you might, you might want to consider thinking of it more of a metaphor. Although I'm certain that this aeon could could appear as a as a human if it if it's so desired, so that might be one of the elements that's working. It might be just evolved uh, humans. Uh, I've also heard that there's a mantid species that are very interested in our evolution. A mantid is an insect-like species that is uh, highly evolved, very caring, and might be working on the behalf of, of freeing us, or at least leveling the praying field, playing field, praying field, praying <laughs> mantis, playing field that, that would free us. Now, you might be asking, where does God come into this? Let me play a little tape, and then I'll finish up after the tape. Um. When I was uh, when I was reading your book, I was uh, I had just been to a uh, an exhibit on Taoism and, mm -hmm. and at a museum in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, and I was reminded a number of times in the book of Taoist philosophy. And then I came upon a passage where you actually uh, referred to Taoism, and and I'm I'm wondering uh, what uh, you know whether it, whether indeed you know I, am I imagining this or are there some real uh, resonances between your mm -hmm. your thinking and Taoist uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm talking about philosophical Taoism, such as you find in the famous classic, the Tao Te Ching, by the famous uh, philosopher Lao Tse. And according to the philosophy of Taoism, ultimate reality, called the Tao, is humble, is unobtrusive, is not prominent, doesn't stick out. But precisely because of that humility of ultimate reality, uh, it allows the rest of nature, the rest of reality, to emerge. And perhaps the best example given by the Tao Te Ching is to imagine a circle, a, a wheel, with spokes converging from a center. And that center, geometrically speaking, is essentially nothing. But yet this nothingness generates a wheel. Or think of the emptiness of a window, which allows light to come in. It's this insight the Taoist philosophy had that that which is most effective is also the most unobtrusive. Mm -hmm. And they have the notion of Wu Wei, which simply can be translated as effective non-interference. So that that which is most effective, most foundational to reality, is not going to be found among the objects of ordinary experience. And I correlate that with the Christian notion of the humility of God. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the themes that perhaps you found perhaps a bit strange. It's not, it's not one that you, you might have grown up with and that many people have not grown up with in their religious experience. But yet, a case can be made and has been made by contemporary theology that this is the, the most characteristic feature of the God of Christianity. And the classic text for this is St. Paul's letter to the Philippians in, in which he puts a, a, an early Christian hymn which says that Christ was in the form of God but did not want to cling to that status but emptied himself and took on the form of a slave. And subsequent theological reflection has 
has taken that to mean that ultimate reality is self-emptying, self-humbling uh, reality. And that fits nicely the new uh, understanding of, of an evolving universe because a humble God would, would not overwhelm the world, would not stick out prominently as one object among others, which is what religion often looks for. Mm -hmm. And we're disappointed because we don't find that kind of God. We find a very unavailable uh, kind of God. But the unavailability of God is, is a correlate of the fact that we find a universe which is constantly striving to become itself. That's mm -hmm. how I understand. From a religious point of view, this is what evolution is, is about. Even the expanding universe that we live in, as Pandenberg has pointed out, can be interpreted theologically as consonant with the theme of a God who lets the world become itself. Mm -hmm. God wills the independence of the world. And this is kind of like the God of Taoism, that, or the ultimate reality. I don't want to use the word God to refer to the Tao, but there's some sense that the, what is ultimately real in the Taoist position is exceedingly humble and unobtrusive mm -hmm. and, and not available to scientific uh, observation. Mm -hmm. So, if you're looking at the demons, and you can see them, and they can see them, they even conjure them up, these archontic demons, and you're wondering where God is, just rest assured that God is everything. It's all around you. The one analogy I like for God is, in, in the Tao, is that it's the emptiness, it's the... Uh, it's the emptiness. It's the stage that allows this thing to be played out on. You know, what makes a bowl useful isn't the, isn't the wood that it's made out of or the china that it's made out of. It's the emptiness in the middle of it. So the God, the way God, the way the Tao, I, I think they're the same to me, uh, is playing this. It's allowing this to take place. When Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. God certainly didn't destroy them. It allowed them to play out this interaction with the demons for, for their own self-betterment and growth. So the God is all around. And there are other entities. Perhaps there's a Christos who's going to make sure the, play, the, level fields, the, the playing field is leveled so that the awakening of consciousness can take place. So, so we've gone from the micro look at the trees, where we're looking at who's right and who's wrong, and what happened to Freddie Gray. Was he given a nickel ride? Uh, who's right? Who's wrong? We moved up to the next step where we realize we're being puppeted in a, in a in a Hunger Games kind of scenario that's going to put in a new world order that's going to lock human consciousness down and not let it evolve any further in a new world order prison. And then he went higher. And we looked at what the, the breakaway civilization is doing and how does that play in. And then we looked at other entities that might be, might be sharing in our drama. They might be working on things like geoengineering that we can't even get a handle on, that the Fukushima radiation that we can't even get a handle on, to, to hold that back or clean that out so that our drama can play out and we can awaken. So what I've tried to do in this podcast is take it from the, from the littlest look to the biggest look till we, till we ended up with a conceptualization of God allowing this to happen and letting ourselves and the other entities that are playing with us uh, work, this, work this thing out. It, so in summary, I have a couple points here. First of all, we're undoubtedly a species experiencing a great awakening. Honest to God, if you were, if you were here in the year 2000 and the year now in 2015, it's we know so much more. We're aware of what's going on. We can see, we can see this whole drama that I un, unfurled for you, and I'm sure it's going to get more sophisticated. We're going to know more and more as time goes on. And this, 
this uh, little podcast will seem rinky-dinky after a while. There also seems to be a dark force holding us back, and that's evidenced by the tools that they're using, like television, fluoride, GMO, sports, sexuality, and what they're trying to do with us to keep us here, keep us, give us bread and circus so we don't look, look beyond. The third point is uh, advanced souls, aliens, interdimensional entities might be helping including the concept of the Aeon Christos, maybe from the Bible or the Gnostic texts. It's in both. Christians, the return of Christ, the Gnostic text, which is the opposite. Talk about the divine Christos, which, which helped create us. I don't think it's a rescue. I think it's more of a leveling in the playing field so we can evolve out of it with our actions. And as I said before, if we were rescued, many of us would object. We're not ready. Some of us might be ready, but all of us certainly aren't. And four, I just want to give you a piece of advice. Don't play the hunger games. Realize that you are so valuable. There are entities risking their lives fighting demons so that you can have this experience and work your way out of this. And it's just a matter of us waking up, realizing that time is a construct, it's a dimension, realizing that we're controlled, but we don't have to be controlled. We can be out of this as soon as we get the lesson. Walk away. Realize that your infinite consciousness evolving through a materialistic existence. And that's all this is. This is part of our evolution. We're evolving through a materialistic existence. And who knows where we're going next? It might be in another type of material existence. It might be a more esoteric kind of etheric existence. Who knows? But anyway, that's my two cents work on what's going on. With the Baltimore riots, the Baltimore Hunger Games, and our consciousness evolution, and our buddies that might be out there fighting for our, our chance to evolve back to, back to the garden. Back to the garden. It'll be lovely when we get there. That's right. Well, that's all we have. That's this episode of The World Beyond Belief, and I'm sure for many people, if you stuck through it, it uh, is way beyond your beliefs. But I hope you had fun with us. We certainly had fun doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and we'll see you again next week. Take care. Bye-bye.